Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Andrea Pirro, Director of the Visiting Artists Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Each academic year, SAC's Visiting Artists Program hosts a variety of presentations by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars with the mission to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art and culture. Throughout its history, the program has served as a critical resource and inspiration for our community. Tonight, I am honored to welcome visiting artist Jan Vo to SAC to discuss his practice with Hendrik Vokertz, the Dittmer Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Art Institute of Chicago. It's an honor to welcome Jan to SAC, and I would like to thank him for taking the time to share his work with our community. I would also like to extend a special thank you to my colleagues, Nora Taylor and Hendrik Vokertz, for their involvement with Jan's visit and their help in making tonight's program possible. I would also like to thank the Illinois Arts Council Agency for their support. At the end of the conversation, we'll have about 10 minutes or so to take some questions from the audience. We ask that if you're uh, posing a question, to please stand and say your name and to, to keep your question concise. Our staff will have microphones circulating for your use. So to introduce our guest this evening, it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Nora Taylor, SAC's Alsdorf Professor of South and Southeast Asian Art and Chair of the Department of Art History, Theory, and Criticism. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. It is my great uh, pleasure and honor to introduce Yan Ba and welcome him back to Chicago. This year, the Art History Department has programmed a, num a number of events to commemorate 50 years since the pivotal year 1968, including a year-long team talk class titled World on Fire 1968 Now. Jan's visit is aligned with this series. Six years ago, in fall 2012, in conjunction with his solo exhibition at the Renaissance Society, the Art Institute installed portions of his long-term project titled We the People on the Bloom Family Terrace. The work consists of a made-to-scale replica of Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi's Statue of Liberty, fragmented into 250 individual copper pieces. Jan Vaugh's version of the iconic statue that now stands majestically on Liberty Island in New York Harbor is not intended to be viewed in its entire vertical upright self. Instead, in breaking it down, the artist has not only metaphorically and li literally taken it apart, dismantled it, but he has also brought it down to a human level, allowing the viewer to experience it at eye level. Jan Vaugh has spent his career picking history apart, apportioning it, salvaging its remains, mining his family's possessions, buying objects at auction houses, or harvesting them from various sources before putting them on display as both signifier and signified, both historical and something else, to be imagined or envisioned by the viewer in a post-Duchampion-like gesture. Thus, a Rolex watch that belonged to his father becomes a coveted object of desire and an emblem of loss during a time of war. A totem pole made up of his grandmother's washing machine, refrigerator, and television set is both statue and the spoils of migration and displacement. Termite-eaten wooden statues of Catholic saints are symbols of faith and references to dismemberment and amputation, or BDSM, fetishism, and bondage. Among the more spectacular objects that he rescued from history are three chandeliers that hung above the table where the Paris Peace Accords were signed in 1973 at the Hotel Majestic. At the recent large retrospective of his work at the Guggenheim Museum last spring, one was hung from the low ceiling close to the winding ramps of Frank Lloyd Wright's building. Chandeliers are rarely seen at eye level, meant to be viewed from the ground like celestial lights, in his exhibition, viewers could examine its in internal structure up close like a scintillating skeleton. Another one was kept in its crate, hung with pieces missing. To fit into the confined space, it was given like an animal, <clears throat> it was, sorry, fit, to fit into the confined space it was given 
like an animal kept in a restricted cage with no room to breathe, almost as punishment for its role in witnessing the fate of the artist's country at the hands of foreign war negotiators. The floors of the Guggenheim were also the sites of scatterings, yet again other metaphors for the dehumanized process of migration, of pieces of luggage that held severed wooden statues cut to suit TSA requirements for carry-ons. War, displacement, conversion, this is the baggage that Jan Vaugh's objects carry, but they are also mu so much more. They're beautiful, sublime, delicate bodies that have been chosen by the artist to speak for historical truths and ideas that transcend his own experience. Vaugh Ki Yan was born into a Catholic family in Bada, South Vietnam in 1975. Four years later, fearing persecution by the newly founded communist regime, they fled by boat and were rescued at sea by a Danish ship that deposited them in a refugee camp in Singapore. His father, believing in fate, sought asylum in Denmark. Thus, Jan grew up in the suburbs of Copenhagen. How much of the artist's biography is embedded in his work is for viewers to decide. But as an art historian of Vietnam, it is terribly exciting for me to watch as his poetic provocations on Vietnamese and American history make their way around the world. This evening, he's in conversation with Hendrik Folkerts, Dittmer Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. Hendrik was previously curator at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam and part of the curatorial team at last year's Documenta 14. Please welcome Hendrik and Jan. Yes, good evening. Hello, everyone. Um, Andrea, Nora, thank you for this fabulous uh, introduction. Uh, they make us uh, blush, I think, to some extent. <clears throat> but we are very happy to, hear, uh, to be here. I think I speak for both of us. Um, so just to give you sort of the lay of the land, what will happen. Um, Jan will speak for some time, just going through some of the uh, images that were part of the uh, catalog that was uh, produced for um, the solo show at the uh, Guggenheim and SMK, uh, sorry, Guggenheim, New York, and SMK in uh, Copenhagen. Um, and after that, we will have a, a conversation. I would ask you to, if you have a uh, question, like uh, Andrea already sort of said it, to save it for the end. There will be actually a lot of room to, to speak, to give feedback, to ask things. So just um, hold your horses for just a little bit. And I think I'll, I'll give the floor to you, Jan. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. being here. Yeah. No, thank, um, thanks for the invitation. <clears throat> I um, will go through like the image side, image side of the catalog that we produce for the last exhibition. Uh, it gives a kind of good overview of uh, different display strategies. And um, um, I never, I mean, I have a studio today, but uh, through all these exhibitions you will see, I never work with a studio, so um, because of practical reasons, the exhibition places became a kind of uh, testing ground, um, a kind of studio, and that's why a lot of works returns and, um, and exists in different constellations and um, spaces. Um, and I think also it's interesting to, you know, like, I mean, this is not a space I can show, but to talk a little bit about how catalogs uh, are created, um, uh, or discussions that I would have in catalog making. And this is one of the examples, if you're ever going to do a catalog, I've lost the battle. You never put like a spread in the middle. It uh, <laughs> doesn't function. Um, and all the uh, pages representing each exhibition ends up with a small description of the show and, and notes. And it always starts with um, invitation card for the show. And in this exhibition at uh, uh, Cristal, uh, Palazzo Cristal, um, I had like 
uh, this is a Corona box in um, this Cristal Palazzo is in uh, Madrid. So there's this Corona gilded box with my father writing on the floor a lyric of uh, Nico, and uh, this has have someone else's will as your own. And uh, together with this, there's does this no. like um, a hanging installation of mam mammoth bones, and uh, and you can see in between them there's like a, a large cr Christ of ivory. Um, this is a broader image of it. And uh, the space, it's it's all like um, display case, so it rains in sometimes, and we had to cover the piece, some pieces in plastic once a while. This is at Ludwig Museum in Cologne. I decided like to um, display a body of certain bodies of my works together with Peter Hucha photographies. And uh, what I was interested in is actually a uh, Robert Smithson um, um, idea. When he built it like this spiral jetty, he had this beautiful comment that sometimes you need like to do a big effort to uh, to express yourself, but other times you just need to cast a glance. And this was one of my simplified way of illustrating it. This is the um, biggest piece of We the People, like the replica of the Statue of Liberty. It's the armpit, and together with it I install, um, as you can see here, the image of, um, oh, sorry, um, Peter Hooja's Candy Darling in her deathbed. And it, uh, it, 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 um, yeah, I installed it because I was so in love with the comment of Peter Hooja. So this is for the Danish pavilion in Venice. I, this, oh, Yes, sorry. It's uh, it's difficult to push this thing, okay. but uh, um, this is um, pieces that I started to do, um, which is constellations of Roman uh, sculptures. This is underneath here. You see a Roman uh, fragment of a sarcophage, and. Uh, probably from a soldier since you have like this illustration of a lion eating some kind of animal and then with a, a Christian sculpture on top. I started to do these sculptures because I, I needed, uh, needed like to have these objects thinking that most empire they will disappear anyhow. So these are sculptures made in order to comfort myself once a while at least. And so this is the um, this is the garden outside, and it has like the um, tiles patterns of the uh, cathedral in Cordoba, which was an old former mosque. And here you see other installation photos. And this is the image of Edward White, the first man in space. On the image here, you see the image illustrates like the uh, how the Homo sapiens started to to occupy uh, the world. And here you have an angel in a Johnny Walker box. I always loved Johnny Walker because they were the first one to invent to economize transportation. They invented like the a square box, um, uh, no square bottles, in order to fit as much as uh, 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 you know to economize space, so you could transport, optimize transportation. And this is before IKEA. <laughs> so this is an exhibition at Marion Goodman in London. These are the first at least 
sculptures of marble, I cut it up. I just, uh, here you can see like a torso, and uh, what was amazing, I mean, I had never cut like ancient sculptures up. Uh, I have a friend that deals with marble, and he was the one that told me that it was interesting because it was not um, Carrara marble, it was actually crystalline marble, which is a Greek marble, and that was interesting because that shows that the Roman didn't only like uh, carved um, the um, uh, like copied the aesthetic of the Roman, but they even extracted Greek um, marble in order to imitate like Greek sculptures, and uh, that's amazing amazing to think of because you have to remember that Roman sculptures were painted, so it was just like a conceptual idea two thousand years ago. Higher, yeah. And this is uh, um, this is Madonna and Child on top of a Roman, um, you know, like Castrata. Why? Why do I, should I do this one? I'm gonna ask our sound people. Where should we point? You can just tell me. Straight there. Straight there. Okay. Here. Here. Okay. To the guy in the back. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, there you go. So <laughs> this is in Mexico, a Jumex. And these are like, um, this is a backdrop of, uh, of, of the collection, um, like of vitrines that the Vatican Museum had uh, on display of Christian ob objects. And I was there one day where they were changing, uh, they wanted to change all the velvet because it, uh, the sun had bleach all the objects on, on the velvet, and, uh, and this is one way of installing it. This is my father writing. And uh, we come back to that, no? This is a um, performance I did at, at the kitchen in New York, where we had like my father writing different kind of texts on the wall. And we had uh, friends of mine, Shushu, playing uh, like a, um, a score that they made speci specifically for this. And then we had like uh, the Thai people that is hand, hand making the gold leaves that I'm using for certain works. So this is one uh, presentation of We the People, where we only use like the first layer, which is flat, of course, and the ear. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, so this is an exhibition that in Mexico called Lock Dog, and it's just pictures of all these locks coming down the Hudson River. And uh, this is the piece called Lock Dog, which is a constellation of all like um, uh, just wood I've collected together with all the uh, leftover cuts that I've done from different pieces. So it's, yeah. Yeah, there's a little angel face and some wings around and, and, and lock dogs too. Yeah, that's, I come back to those work too. And this is the invitation card of uh, like an exhibition I did at Musée d'Art Moderne. And it's really one of my favorite ones because I I really had problems working with the museum, so I told them that uh, for the invitation card, it should just look like you get a bill in the mailbox. You know? <laughs> so that's how this data came out. This is one of the chandeliers, and this is a good example of 
you know, like the using the museums as a test ground. I, you know, when you transport like a chandelier, you take them apart. So every time you see it actually together, it takes a big effort to put it together. And other times I do like the easy solution by just displaying how, you know, like laying like this. This is a, uh, at Marin Goodman in New York. It's called Mother Tongue. The image behind uh, you can see is, uh, oh, so, you know, I always said that I was born on a lucky star. Things many times comes to me. And at this time, uh, the time when I did this exhibition, there was like announced by Sotheby Sotheby's that uh, a lot of pr personal, um, um, objects from the estate of Mac, uh, Robert McNamara um, would be sold in an auction at, at Sotheby's. So I asked uh, Marin Goodman that if you could go and look at some stuff that could be interesting for, for a potential exhibition at her place. And she went there and we bought uh, several pieces from the auction and that became the exhibition Mother uh, Tongue. And this is the two cabinet chairs that was used by uh, McNamara and JFK. And uh, many people, ask, you know, like comments on it as a destruction. And I always thought of it as, you know, it's these two big leather chairs, who, which is really unsexy. And I never thought of like deconstruction or, or whatever. I thought of trying to sex these things up a bit. And that's what you see. So these are, you know, wires on the floor. And on the right side, you see like different pin tips. And what was beautiful in this state was that most of these objects he had already given to the different presidential libraries. And uh, he would keep like the nuclear ban test uh, resolution and the Tonkin res res resolution, which uh, uh, started the Vietnam War. And then these four was uh, the signing of doubling the, uh, doubling the budget of the defense, minister, uh, defense department at the time. And nobody was, of course, really interested in that. So I think the president gave him four, you know, there was, but for him, of course, it was a major thing because that created like the war machine that America became at the time. Menu. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the menu. <laughs> oh. And when I was uh, awarded like the Hugo Boss Prize, I was working at the time uh, with the estate of Martin Wong, an artist that I really loved because he was able to speak in in so many um, languages all at the same time. He was together with graffiti guys and his parents and gay underground and somehow he managed like all these milieu, uh, like uh, environments to exist together. And I took, um, when I met like the mother, she had like all these collected objects that uh, they collected together and um, I just had like this really attachment to it through the work I do with my father and um, and uh, and it for me all these can you point to the scrolls like on one side like these are the collect on the other side the collection of uh, writings he was very interested in, in ancient writings so he collected a lot of uh, Kufic writings Chinese calligraphy and at the same time when he moved to New York, that was when he started like the wish to create a new language because he thought graffiti was this amazing way of thinking new language. And uh, what you, and when you ever see paintings of him, think of like this combination of ancient writings together with graffiti. That was how he managed to really compress history. And that is just a astonishing ability to be able to do. 
and it was just a crazy collection of stuff that I thought really in many ways also illustrate his thinking. And um, I, I can be honest, in this occasion, it was actually a friend of mine that told me that because I took a lot of people to the home and thought that museums should keep this as a reference to the paintings that Martin Wong was working with. Mm -hmm. But uh, nobody really wanted to do that. I was told by a curator in MoMA that he needed like a bigger name because it's very costly to keep so many objects. It's like around 4,000 4, objects. And it was the curator that told me, Young, you know, if you make it into an artwork, there's better possibility that some institutions would keep that. And that was basically what I do. And that illustrates also a certain thinking that I have, which is you do things because of practical reasons. That's the burger lamp. They had a, the Florence Fee, the mother, always said that whatever they love, it would become a collection. So they loved burgers. So they had like this big collection of burgers, including like a burger lamp. It's a, cool <laughs> it's a really beautiful lamp. <laughs> That's my uh, nephew. Uh, I started to work uh, with him when he showed me one time this thing. You know, he was like Uncle Young. Do you want to see my wing? And uh, I said, yeah, of course. And that's what he showed me. And that was the time where I had worked a lot with my father. So I always, in my method of working is always to try to work in opposition. So in one hand, if you work with your father, you should also be able to work with the next generation. And that became one of the projects. And I thought it was really beautiful, this moment in life where you have the beautiful ability to fantasize about something else. So I did some casting of him. This is in a bank, so you had a vault underneath too, and what I did was to take everything that they kept in the, in the bank boxes underneath, and I installed it with certain works, and then you see in the next picture the entrance of uh, the vault. Mm. And this is the first time I had like these double layers of my father's writing. Did you go in a space like that, sort of acknowledging the specificity of a space, or how, how did you approach that? No, I think I always was very curious and, and adventurous, you know? When I see a new space, I think, okay, how does the work um, interact? And, uh, and uh, I, th I think always it's important to think of, I mean, to test the work in itself, because you always have ideal situations for artwork, but I think the artwork, I mean, I, it's a kind of also mistrust on myself, like to test it out in different situations in order to see if a work survives or not, you know? And it uh, learns me about the quality of certain works and, and you know, disqualification in other kinds. Like in this particular case, how did work start to respond to, I mean, what is a very specific history of a space? I, I think it was just, it looks crazy, no? <laughs> <laughs> Which one is this? Oh, this is Villa Medici. This was an exhibition where they didn't have any budget, but they had like, uh, it's a residency program, but also of course the old castle of the Medici is in Rome. And uh, they only had like, yeah, that, that it's my practicality that comes back, you know. They could only provide like rooms because they have a, I mean it's a big castle. So I, what I use like this situation to invite my family, which is like 19 people plus, <laughs> to stay over Christmas because I hadn't had Christmas with my parents for, <laughs> or my family for 10 years or something. So we, when everybody was gone, we, I let like all my nieces and nephew lose. I bought like a lot of colors and stuff. And uh, I wanted to make this backdrop and then I would hang different kind of, um, and works on it. So that's how it came to look like. Oh, this is at the Renaissance Society exhibition. There are the Kissinger letters again. We made like an entrance, like that was the entrance to the exhibition place. 
and we had like different fragments around in the museums. Huh? Yeah. As you can see, I love like Canadian boxes. Um, so there's different sculptures that uh, lies in them too. That's the, I think that's the ear and hair. Yeah, this was in the garden, no, of the Art Institute here. Yeah, yeah. 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 A fragment of uh, We the People. You know, like, these are the, um, I started like to be interested, which was actually through one of the Kissinger letters. It's the Kissinger letters is a group of letters that I acquired like 2009, I think. And in one of them, he um, writes beautifully uh, because Sylvia Ly Leonard Lyons' wife had sent him this book, which was a um, biography of Lincoln. And uh, he writes on it, I had to look it up, you know, that uh, looking at the book and seeing the Capitol without the dome because it was not finished at the time during the Civil War, uh, it reminds him of, of uh, how time has changed. And that's such an amazing, um, you know, reflection because it, that's how history is. You fight for independence, you fight for getting the country together until a situation where Kissinger is sitting there with world dominance. And that was when I started like, to think of history as this circular, I probably thought of history as a circular uh, way, but uh, but that really triggered like my use of the 13 star flag like to use an icon of how the f this is the first um, um design of the Amer american flag when they won the independence from the when the 13 states uh, won the independence from uh, uk and uh, like um Brit uh, great britain and that the flag illustrates the independence of the 13 stars but of course when the um, United States uh, conquered more land and bought more states, they would add more stars in. And actually today, I think they have prepared like for the next two, like 52 states, I think, no? Yeah, which is Guam and, and Puerto Rico. So let's see if that happens or not. This is, yeah, Regens. Peter Sumtour, a fantastic architect. Why the gold, Jan? I've always wondered. Because like gold is sort of a very recurrent color. It was, I think there was a pure, I mean, there was two things in it. One thing was that I, after school, I had like a, 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 a very good friend I started with, a Thai. Patai Pintong, he moved back to Thailand when uh, after the studies in the Stadel Jewel. And um, I was there for, you know, like that was when I first started to travel in Asia, which was in Bangkok. And uh, at a certain point, because I was just staying there for long periods, but at a certain point I, I didn't had, uh, you know, I started to do more and more exhibitions. And the only way that I could stay in Bangkok extensively was to work there. Mm. And uh, I'm sure that we were drunk or something, and we needed like to come up with something to work on. And uh, two of the materials you have a lot in, in Bangkok is, of course, uh, cardboard, and the other one is the gold leaf tradition with all the yeah. pagodas and whatever. And at Thai art, like in Thai art school, you really learn to apply gold on paintings, which is a, a strong tradition in, in Thailand. And uh, what, um, and so he knew how to do it, you know. So we bought some material, and it was just like a beautiful combination of material that uh, that turned into the flags and to the uh, gilded boxes. And this is whiskey and virgin hairs. They hang in between all the things. 
this is uh, yeah, this is Fredisianum when I started to do the um, uh, replica of the Statue of Liberty. At that time, I actually didn't have like exhibited in a lot of uh, uh, museum spaces, but Ryan Wolfs, who uh, directed Fredisianum, which is a gigantic um, uh, Kunsthalle, but in museum the castle, like, no? uh, Germany. Yeah. And usually he would do like exhibitions, um, uh, like three solo exhibitions at the same time. But he came to me and he told me that he had seen different kind of exhibitions around. And he really liked the way that I just could put very few things in big spaces without, you know, like, and, and that it functions. So he wanted to give me the whole Kunsthalle and... Uh, I have like this kind of very um, childish behavior, you know, when people box me in, I try to run the other way. So I was sitting there and I was thinking, okay, I'm going to try to stuff that place with something <laughs> really, really big. <laughs> and in my simple mind, the thing, only thing I could think of was the Statue of Liberty. And I think also that... Uh, because I'm of its scale, because of its grandeur yeah because of the size i think you know i thought uh, okay if something should be really big in that what could <laughs> it be and secondly i think also at the time there was a lot of writings about me you know using my private history and stuff like this which i really you know had problems with so i thought oh, maybe the statue of liberty image is not so bad because i thought everybody had like an opinion yeah. about it Everyone knows it. Yeah. And yeah, that is everybody's <laughs> history, no? But then when I did it and people still started to write about immigration and my personal story and I thought, I'm never gonna go back there, you know, this is out of my control. Totally, yeah, it was, it, it's sort of how people looked at it was very different maybe than the initial sort of uh, intention. Yeah, I think it was projected on me, yeah. you know? Yeah, because, exactly. you know, when I started to research into it, uh, there was so many great thinking, uh, like um, there were so many great people that have thought interesting things about the Statue of Liberty that I was much more attached to. Like uh, one was writing that the reason why the Statue of Liberty had to be a woman was that it needed to be this empty vessel, passive, that anybody could project whatever they wanted inside of it, you know. And I think freedom, as I have experienced recently, is about that, you know. And I think also, like, you know, at the time, we also had been through, like, several countries that went to war in the name of freedom. So in so many ways, I thought it was a, a, a interesting um, subject matter to work with. Uh, and... and uh, but on the other hand, I mean, there's sort of like a specificity to the choice. You could have talked to Ryan and said, you know, you have this amazing square in front of your uh, Friedrichianum. I want to build the Statue of uh, Liberty there. But it was a choice to take it apart as well. Yeah, I think uh, I, uh, I think of myself at least uh, at that time for sure that I was not an artist that was that was meant to do big scale project and, and never had it in my mind, you know. So I really had a motto at the time that if I was engaging in creating so, like, I mean, big projects, I should also be able to treat it as it was water. But I think, you know, like, I had never seen the Statue of Liberty at the time, but I was researching a little bit. I would say that, you know, you get, like, these weird ideas or stupid ideas, but researching into it, and when I discovered that the uh, original one was uh, constructed um, through through this technique called repoussé, where you hammer copper into form, um, it really, it was a... First time I discovered that the Statue of Liberty was actually only two millimeter thick, which is the size of two pennies, I think. Coach. Yeah, and I think these contradiction of information where in one hand you have this gigantic monument and, and icon, and at the same time 
so fragile. I thought that was an interesting uh, contradiction, and uh, and these contradictions are the best uh, starting point for 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 any works, I think. And and uh, in the original one, you would actually have Eiffel creating like a steel construction in order to uphold the facade, and it it became very natural for me to think, okay, that's perfect, because then we only copy the skin of it. And without the skeleton, it would look like this. So it was not like, I mean, I, it was the workers in China that just brought it, you know. I had most of these pieces I've never seen. I told Rhein, you know, uh, if you say yes to this, I mean, I have no control of what would appear how much that would be, and it, it, uh, in many ways it was like creating Frankenstein, you know, that gets its own life and just determines its own um, way. Did you, did you feel at that point in time um, like a shift between sort of the reproduction of something? I mean, sort of putting in the order to reproduce the Statue of uh, Liberty Versus, which is not exactly versus, but I'm going to say it for uh, argument's sake, uh, like uh, appropriation of a found object in a sense and using it directly, a uh, quote unquote. Yeah, that's the bad part of it because I think the most uh, beautiful objects exist already out there, you know. But it's a way of, I mean, I, I, it's a way of looking at things and, you know, like there's so many things that have to inherit that beauty and it's a way of looking I think and uh, I think the failure with such a project like this is that I had to produce it because yeah. can't appropriate it directly exactly <laughs> maybe in the future but. <laughs> but also I kind of like what you're saying that at a certain point it is also out of your hands like someone else did this for you yeah like like can you yeah how was can you talk no, to but this is, that, you know, like so. um, what I like about such a process is that uh, I was never, I mean, probably because I didn't have a studio, but the, I, I always love to start a project and that the project takes you somewhere and that you learn by it and it forces you to, you know, like with this project, I mean, I've never uh, dealt with economy, practicality, um, logistic in the scale, you know? I mean, I had to learn it by doing. Yes, yeah. and, uh, and, and, uh, and that's, for me, have always been an uh, uh, important thing, that, that projects pushes you somewhere else. Well, and the project went to a lot of places in that sense. So this kind of like distribution of the sculpture um, in many different places. Yeah, but you know, like I tell you, there was like eight or ten container that yeah. came. I didn't knew what was in the <laughs> container, and they came out there, and it could, you know, like I, I, I in, my, in my fantasy, I couldn't even imagine what it would be, and it, you know, like when it came in, it was kind of a lucky punch because what happened, which I of course didn't foresaw or, or was thinking of was that when you break these elements down, you get like a representation of art history because you got all kind of forms like geometrical, figurative, you know, organic. It, it just, uh, no, I, I remember still first time I w walked through the space, it was really this kind of strange looking back in history in all these forms but also in an extremely melancholic way. Or would you disagree with me? Mm, yeah, I, 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 at the time when I was thinking of doing the project, I knew that I could only think of logistic and not add meaning into it. And I think you commented on it before, no? Yeah. That, and I think also it's not needed. There is all these kind of, you know, I always yeah. said that the Statue of Liberty have been raped enough. You know, you don't need to add mean more meaning into yeah. it. I think you can reshuffle things, throw things in the air, and yeah. rediscuss the purpose at least.
were all the pieces immediately shown at uh, no, uh, no, no, that was impossible, right? No, yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, the concept was that whatever was finished, which was like uh, one fourth of it, that's what we, sh you know, just threw into the spaces. I'm trying to formulate my question here. Um, because we've been hearing you, you know, talk about how different objects, sort of, in your uh, like uh, practice, reappear or reemerge in various spaces that you have sort of uh, exhibited in, and I feel we, the people, from you know, which took place between 2011 and 2016, so over the span of five years, really, starting here in the uh, Friedrichshafen that was integral to the work, this kind of like distribution and sort of reappearance. And I'm just curious, uh, sort of in those five years, how this work started to integrate with other parts of your practice and how you started it, uh, sorry, how you looked at it at that point in time. No, I think it integrated naturally in yeah. other projects and, um, and uh, yeah, I, that is a good answer. <laughs> and it does. There was yeah. also this element um, in yeah, the Friedrich Channel wanted, like, show. There's always like some objects or, or images that I add into um, the exhibition. I think we did like all the stacks of copper, uh, which was the remains of things that wasn't produced yet. So these are all the copper sheets. And on top of that, I had like um, uh, the newspaper announcing Baba Bush's uh, wedding, and uh, the um, the typewriter that Ted Kaczynski was uh, writing him his manifesto in, as a balance point to what freedom can be. Just one more question about the show. The title of the show. Um, bear some significance. Yeah, that's July the 4th, no? It's yeah. The and then the year. Yeah. yeah. As this kind of like. It's actually written on the tablet that she's holding. Yeah. No, no and that's, I mean, of course, what you say, it integrates naturally because this sort of uh, July the 4th date speaks to a lot of other parts of your work as well, whether from the flags to the Statue of Liberty. No. The, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, like, I think uh, it's. I think behind all the celebration, there's always dark sides, you know? And I think sometimes we fall in the trap of dealing with the dark sides with, uh, where, you know, like I think it's actually much more interesting to deal with celebration and what that actually means. Um, and especially in our time where all like atrocities are just hidden by behind out in the bright light of our mm -hmm. daily life. Oh, yeah, that's a pop-up birthday cake. <laughs> it's like, and I actually did the same one for the Danish pavilion. It was folded in the image, but it became a concept because the only place that I uh, exhibit in Denmark is at the National Gallery, and every time I have an exhibition with them, I make a birthday cake. And this is one of the flags. It was a very dark room, so I tried to use all the light sources around. So the sculptures were lit. Yeah, we can, it comes again. Maybe we take it oh, next great. time. Yes. Yeah. So this is one on the is that right side? It's, uh, it's the engine of my father's um, uh, Mercedes. That was like the <coughs> most expensive car that he managed to buy at the time. And it was, of course, an old taxi. But uh, uh, I, I took it out and made a sculpture out of it. And on the other page, you see like um, the objects that my grandmother would see receive from the um, um, what do we call it? Like the German, you know. Um, Can you maybe describe it to me? No, the you know when you come and you don't as a refugee and you start up a new life. The social. Oh uh, yeah, the, uh, the uh, so 
So yeah, they would give you different kind of objects to start your life with, yeah. and those are of course a television, a like a washing machine, and a washing machine, like a refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't see the back of the fridge door, but that was the crucifix that uh, that I still don't know uh, how the Catholic Church knows it, but they apparently are aware that if you if Catholic refugees arrive, they send like a crucifix to them. Mm -hmm. And what you see is, of course, the appliances have changed over the year, but the crucifix is still the same as the, when she received it. So the work called Oma uh, Totem, um, like sort of a totem pole in that sense, has a very specific historical significance and meaning. How did you think of this work as kind of like a totem in that sense? I'm curious how, how that word came in. Yeah, that's, you know, like, I think it's pure form, you know? It's, uh, I mean, when I start to work on these projects, I actually even don't know how to install them. And when I call my grandmother that lived at the time to get, like, her stuff, and I would buy her some new ones, you know? And, uh, and I didn't know how it would look like, but... Um, playing around with it in the gallery, I think the most practical but also aesthetical way was to just stack them on top of each other. And no, I think maybe I ha had thought to stack them up and then the crucifix should be even on top of everything, but that just looked terrible, you know? And then we hammered it on the door instead. Yeah. And that was much better. And that's one of the things that many times um, people forget that, you know, like, I'm more trained as an artist than historian. <laughs> so a lot of uh, um, aesthetical question is, of course, something I deal with too. And these are the one of, uh, as Nora mentioned, these are the first um, you know, like old sculptures that I started to cut up. And I think it was like around the time where, like after sev September 11, that was when uh, you had all these kind of restriction of what you can bring in the airplane and not. And of course, Evil EasyJet, which is this low cost, com cost company in Europe, uh, of course started to use the situation to charge people for hand luggages or luggages. So they had all these restriction of, of how, um, what you could you know, carry, bring in order to earn more money. And, uh, I thought that was a really good measurement to start any sculpture with, and when I look at them, it uh, it is this kind of fucked up way of dealing with sculpture uh, throughout art history, that you take the figurative um, Christian sculptures and you try to fit it into a given measurement. Um, and that's how I you know, learned art history. Quite, I mean, in that sense, really like a new direction because it also led to sort of sculptures being cut into the box to, to fit into somewhere where they're maybe not supposed to fit in. Do you consider this, this cutting off, this, this sort of rearranging of the shape, if you will, is it an act of violence? Is it a, what kind of act is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I was, but when you start to cut two or three, then mm -hmm. it... Yeah, it yeah, and then you know, like I think it's also sometimes that um, that fragments. I mean, this is all like Rodin was very much into it. You know, like the fragments of things illustrates the bigger picture. You don't need much in order to to express things, and uh, and 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 then. I mean, oh, well, okay, I don't need that. I can do it like this. Um, just to briefly go back to Oma uh, mm. Totem, but also uh, actually many other works in that sense, sort of from cutting up, you know, like sort of um, as an is sort of uh, initial sort of violation and then as a kind of normalization of that act actually and sort of, sort of uh, embedded in what you do to creating like hybrid sculptural structures. I've yeah. also been very fascinated with these saint statues that we saw an image of in the, in the Danish uh, pavilion app behind the red uh, background, but also so sort of the uh, Oma uh, totem as this hybrid structure. So also of like reassembling again. Yeah, I think it's like, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a curiosity I have, like 
sometimes I want like to to I wish in my production that I can you know like that I I have the chance to work with really big projects or sculptures, and then in the other hand I think I want to test myself out like what small sculptures means and work in 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 uh, oppositions and the, these two the, the, these two sculptures are also an interesting um, illustration of how I think because in one hand I think you can take something out and not adding anything to it but in other cases you need like to put them together and it's a it's a curiosity of how sculpture functions and it, in in the end it's also an experiment yeah and similar to like we the people how the parts relate to the whole also okay. yeah Oh. Yeah. This is the project where um, this is a where I have all my father's writing um, together, and one thing that I really um, was interested in starting um, to use my father's writing is that Vietnamese is the only language that uh, in Asia that was transcripted into Latin and the former uh, inspired uh, Chinese script is only um, it's only scholars that actually knows how to to read that so anybody in Vietnam or any Vietnamese today that reads and write uh, Vietnamese they do it in Latin and what I found so interesting was that in in the 30 years that my father lived in Denmark, he never really used it beside of writing like menus and you know signs of Coca-Cola and burger for 25 kroners or whatever. And um, one of the concerns I have creating art is 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 the question of what what is it that a given a given society qualifies as as uh, valuable and what is not. And I thought my father's writing was an interesting phenomenon. Like, like what is this, you know, like this, for him, a disqualifica if, uh, disqualification when he came to, to a Western country. And I wanted somehow to activate that. And, uh, and when Just I just to just to ask that, just to understand it a bit more, do you think he felt inhibited at that time? Like it's something that I cannot do. No, here, it's just. I mean, it too he special, didn't. too precious. No, he just uh, didn't really learn to to speak, or even you know, like he didn't learn to write in Danish or any Western language, and barely learned to speak Danish, and uh, and that that. Uh, you know, you don't read like the newspaper, or you don't do different kind of things. And in that way, the qualification became amputated through uh, not learning the language. And, and, but, it, but he had this beautiful handwriting that I thought could be really interesting to activate. And I think um, that really became one of my pressures. I always said that if I really contributed anything to the arts, I think it is with this project because it, deal so much with how, you know, language travels, you know, like how Latin travels to Vietnam through colonial history, and uh, it returns back to Europe in the body of my father, just mutated, and how that I was able to reintroduce it in the culture of the Western world. How did you ask him to become part of your exhibitions, your projects. I'm really curious how that conversation went. I gave went. him money. <laughs> <laughs> so the concept was that, you know, for each letter he would... So I found like this uh, letter of a, of, a, of a French missionary that worked in Vietnam in the 19th century. That was the time that uh, fr the French hadn't colonized Indochina at, um, yet. And uh, what I thought also was it was interesting to, because power struggles are not a dialectic. It 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 changes, and um, and when my work was dealing, I mean, you know, I had like different 
uh, bodies of work dealing with the Vietnam uh, War. And I wanted like, to take it further back in history where the Vietnamese were in control. So that was how I got into the missionaries that was killed en masse because uh, they were prohibited to uh, mission, uh, do missionary works in Vietnam in, in the mid 19th century. So when I, through the research into the killed missionaries, I discovered this beautiful letter of a venerated saint that would write letters back to his parents and family basically before he was um, executed. And I found like this beautiful last letter that he, Till van Venard, would write to his own father. And when I saw that letter, I th that was when it clicked that this is what my father should write the rest of his life. Yeah. And uh, it became this weird project that uh, he would get $100, and I got $100, and whoever sold it got $100, you know. Yeah. And um, today he has written over 1,600 letters, I think. So in that sense, it, it's actually a, the biggest project I've done. And, and you don't need that much to do big projects. No, and, and a and project of such of deep significance, like yeah. in every way. Yeah. yeah, so in this case, I ask him to, we, we, we can go to the next pictures. I was, uh, I wanted, I, it's, uh, it was a project where he would use his own handwriting to, to write uh, his, own, the, his own epitaph for his, uh, for his tombstone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we, we were traveling in, in, in um, Rome where I discovered um, uh, Oh my God, what is the name of the poet? My brain. The name of the poet in Rome. Uh, yeah, he died very young, an English poet. Keats, yeah, Keats. sorry. And uh, he wanted like um, to have on his epitaph that here lies one whose name is writ in water, which is really a beautiful epitaph, but I thought that belongs to so many other people than John Keats. So we did a project where my father wrote it uh, for himself. And uh, it's a conceptual work that it's actually owned by Walker. And um, they're holding it. Um, so it's, it was a time where I experimented with, with this kind of different notion of what a sculpture could be and how it could be negotiated in, on different levels. And so you can see that in, at Walker today. And sorry about that. It was really loud. Um, I also, of course, I mean, knowing the work at the Walker, um, there is like a future history of that work in a way. No, that the idea is is that um, the museum would would return it in 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 some kind of way. Um, you know, uh, when your father is no longer with us. Yeah. Um, how how did you start talking about? that work with your father like that, but also with the museum like that, just to understand it a bit more. Yeah, it's a complex no, conversation. On, it on, is, on but level. it was like, uh, I mean, I think I always had an interest in challenging um, the notion of what a sculpture could be. Yeah. And in this case, for sure, I would take something that was so, I mean, a tombstone is, of course, in our perception, something that just stays in one place. Mm -hmm. And uh, to shake that idea was an experiment of how far can you go with creating a sculpture and the negotiation through those uh, situations. And at the time, I was, uh, you know, like it was for sure also inspired by Jean Genet because, mm -hmm. you know, like he, there's this beautiful story that uh, the uh, brass element on his own tombstone was stolen one time. And the caretaker, which was the son of his lover, uh, uh, because when he was alive, they earned money on covering, co you know, make fake uh, manuscripts, like the lover, Chenet, the son of the lover. And they were trained then to write like Chenet's uh, handwriting. Wow. So when the brass thing disappeared and the son of the lover 
had to replace it. He thought, okay, I'm not gonna put a new brass plate. I'm gonna just write Jean Genet on directly on the tombstone, mm. and he engraved it. But since he learned like to write Jean Genet with his uh, signature, it becomes almost his own uh, handwriting on the on the tombstone. And this is the this is the letter that my father writes r replicates of uh, Til van Venard, and I always wondered like I mean a lot of people would frame it like you know with traditional frame I always loved the click frames because I I always said that that uh, that you know to turn calligraphy into labor and that's what I really uh, consider the work, like how my father through these years now, like eight years or nine years, have turn, turned into a machine, you know, when you see like the latest letters that he's doing, it's just, it's like a copy. And, uh, and I always wanted to display it in this cheap clip frame, like the standardized but so it's a idea form of, of a But on the other hand, sorry to interrupt, but it's a form of reproduction that um, is also invokes kind of like uh, authenticity, like the handwritten letter, like reproduced endlessly. Yeah, Not but I think in the beginning they they were, um, you know, like they, uh, you could see the difference, but I think today, I mean, I cannot see the difference between the last fifty hundred or something, and I think for me that makes the, ex um, the project exciting because it was never like to enhance the idea of calligraphy, but I wanted like to turn calligraphy into labor. And, and this is, it's something that in all my projects I'm concerned with how you, you reshuffle these convention of things. And, um, and I, you know, I don't want like calligraphy to be this kind of on a pedestal or whatever. It is just a skill that my father in co you know, inherited. And it's, for me, the only important thing is to activate it. Yeah. But it can only be activated as labor. And, and um, oh, that's at least my thinking of it. Yeah. But what I also, I mean, it's a complex, I mean, I think it, it's an interesting uh, proposal because why I think of it as a successful uh, work is that it, you know, it incorporates labor. My father is producing it. It incorporates my thinking, my interest in it, and then the projection, the viewer that looks at it. And there's no real, um, there's no real attachment except, except this object. But there's no understanding. I think my father has a total another you know, idea, you know, thinking what this is, and me and the viewer. And uh, the first year, because I just gave him money, he was just copying it, until he, he has like this chat site where he talks with other kind of expat Vietnamese, and apparently he talks talk with some that spoke French, mm -hmm. and he um, came back to me and he was like young, why didn't you tell me that I'm writing this, um, you know, the letter of a very important saint? He's very Catholic. And I was like, but that's not a, you know, that was not the concept. You should just, you know, that you got money to write this letter. <laughs> and uh, after that, you know, he took it over. And this is also what I like about the project because it mutates, it's out of my hands. And he would start to write letters and he would send it to churches he likes. My nieces and nephew, when they had birthday, he would send them one too, and uh, <laughs> you know, so it 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 really also it, you know it's out of my control even, yes. and that's one that's when a project becomes interesting because you cannot control it. Well, perhaps it's similar how the sculpture of uh, We the People became something that is out of your control yeah, in yeah. that sense as well. No, I think that's important that uh, they can do that. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, and also, I mean, here's me, the viewer, having an opinion about this work, so I, I know you don't like it, but <laughs> I'm going to go for it. Also, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's such a core work as well because, um, you know, throughout your uh, practice and all these exhibitions that we're looking at now, there are sometimes 
historically very significant or specific objects that are constantly like reshuffled in meaning and taken into taken in and out of different uh, contexts. And I'm so fascinated by, by how the idea of how like a written letter, which is you know, for me still a very authentic or original concept, like someone writes something, there's labor in it, there's like reproduction in it. Um, how something like that actually through the act of that labor and kind of like reproduction also disseminates and shuffles that meaning of the sort of original, which is a complete fiction to begin with, of course. So yeah, I see kind of a connection that it, you don't have to respond to if you don't want to, but. <laughs> um, I'm trying to make my way to Kunst Tala Basel as well, actually, okay. to be okay. very honest. Yeah. So if you don't mind, yeah. I'll shuffle a bit because I have my eye on the time. Yes. Um, fantastic uh, exhibition, actually. Um, we talked briefly about the uh, chandelier works already, but maybe, yes, yeah, kind of like an invitation to introduce this image as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, like this was the first time I put like the chandeliers together. And one reason was really like uh, it had, it was a practical, it was aesthetical uh, decision that you have the Kunsthal Basel, like the uh, natural light. And it was in the summer months, so I knew that there would be light uh, through, the mo through the whole exhibition. And I wanted to see it as this kind of sun clock. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was how it looked like. And that was the time where I also had the luxury of being naive, because I was just thinking, whatever you had of object, you just had to have it function in a space. And people thought that it was very conscious that, you know, it was sparse and it, it, it just looked simple. But that was what I had, you know, and you just had to have it functioning. And what I, you know, like it, it, it was interesting. This was one of the first time that I was doing the installation with the chandelier. And I had never taken like a ready-made in and installed, like thinking, uh, insisting on it as a, as a, artwork but I think before we deinstall it and, and, and install it here in Parcel I wanted like to take my father uh, to the original space and what constituted the work for me you know it's all in one's mind because my problem was of course how, what does it really mean to take a souvenir of history that was my projection into the object and display it insist, insist on its meaning um, that idea I always had problems with until I took my father to the room. In the taxi, he always was like, oh my God, we're going to the room of betrayal. You know, as a South Vietnamese, that peace agreement was, of course, the betrayal because the American withdrew the soldiers and ended up with North Vietnam taking over South Vietnam. So he was just like very disturbed on the taxi to see the space. and. I had asked the, somebody to lit on, and it's this old, like, 19, uh, uh, early 20th century ballroom French style, you know, like, uh, designed to leave your sorrow behind. And uh, it's true, because when he entered the room, the only thing he could say was, Young, I think that the Queen of Denmark must have one of those in her castle. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was interesting was that he was seeing the, fun, you know, like the the purpose of such a design. The purpose is that when you enter a ballroom, you leave your sorrow behind. You forget. Mm -hmm. And for me, that totally created the piece because if I was dealing with this piece historically, then history is that we are forgetting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like. Um, and is this, <clears throat> so this object indeed functioned as a shift in that respect to start thinking about the specificity of it in a certain space? I'm trying to tease out what that shift for you was. That, that shift is probably like a desire for, me, no, a, a need for me to project certain things in mm -hmm. it that's not there, and then the pure functionality of yeah. that, what that yeah. thing is, yeah. and and that somewhere, it gives like a a space, for the viewer to actually yeah. engage. You know, 
I yeah. still don't know where I place myself in between these things. No. But I think objects should have like an openness for people to engage or not. Yeah. Well, and the fact that it fa functioned as a sundial, while once upon a time it was witness, if you will, uh, to one of the most historically significant moments uh, in the uh, 20th century. Yeah. Wow. But the object you see on the floor, I think in the next picture we uh, see the same. This is an example of how I, you know, testing things out because after I did like the Oma Totem, my, my mm. grandmother died like six months after. So that was the first time I actually thought of doing a tombstone. And one of the reasons was really that I wanted to design a tombstone that at that time uh, could be exhibited in, in, in the space and then taken out and have another kind of functionality. It was a kind of counterpoint to the idea of taking a chandelier inside of space and that became like an artwork later, moving from one space to another. And originally, actually, I asked my mother, as she is the you know eldest daughter of my grandmother, uh, to design it, um, to the dis and I would produce it. Mm -hmm. But she had like crazy ideas, like <laughs> really crazy ideas. So <laughs> I had to stop her, and I told her, "Listen, you know, <laughs> maybe we, you know, like uh, I would put, I would get the family together." And I told her, "For me, you know, the Oma totem meant a lot to me, and and if." they could imagine we would take like the relief and carve it in granite and marble and use it as a French tombstone for my uh, grandmother. And they all agreed and today mm. it's it's in Westerkirchegård in Copenhagen. Beautiful. So as a, um, we're not alone in this space, we have to open it up a certain time. But yeah. uh, Andrea, just two more minutes, because um, two more, yeah. well, or whatever. Yeah. How no, much no, no, time do you want to take? Um, I think we can go through. Yeah, we talked about one, uh, no? s some of them. I was thinking to um, end with good life, if that's yeah, okay with that's you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, then I'll make my way to the end. Um, here we go. Yes. Hold on, am I at the right spot here? Sure. Yes, yes, there it is. Um, Good Life, a very early project, in fact, from 2007, yeah. um, Isabella Bortolozzi Gallery. Um, just to maybe to have a look at the images before. Whoop. Now it's really giving up. So, uh, um, I was on a residency in Los Angeles and this elder guy who was 80 something at the time, early 80s. He was the first, you know, I don't, my name is spelled with a D but pronounced Jan. And uh, he was the first one uh, at the residency I had like to give a talk about my work. And there was the neighbors would come by, pass by. And, and there was this uh, uh, Joe, he would approach me and he could pronounce my name. Uh, you know, as my correctly, and uh, and at the same time, I could see that he had some kind of attraction to me. So I asked him how, you know, why he was able to do that, and he told me that he, you know, he had been working in Vietnam from '62 to '73. So, you know, like I was not sitting at home and thinking of a project, you know, relating Vietnam War with uh, homos the uh, homosexuality. But of course, in front of me, there was this person. So I thought that, uh, I mean, he was, he didn't stay that long, but he told me that, you know, anytime I wanted like to uh, visit him since he lived very close by, I should knock at his door. And 10 o'clock the, the next day, I think, I was knocking at his door and, and I came in and I thought at the time that I would get like an oral history. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know, like I think at some time he expressed that he would love to travel to Vietnam again, but he was not able to do it alone. So if I would accompany him, I, you know, he would love that. And I had never been to Vietnam at the time, so I thought, okay, that's a good chance, you know, uh, to to travel there. 
and it was in Vietnam that I got to know that he these photos existed. It doesn't happen so much anymore uh, that you have this different intimacy uh, between men that you can hold it, ha you know, you hold hands and and you can uh, sleep, uh, you know, tied together. It it doesn't. It's actually not an expression of homosexuality. It's an expression of high, yeah. high. What do you call it? Like hyper masculine society where you yeah. don't think that homosexuality exists. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but for Joe, of course, in '62, you have to remember the very homophobic society America yeah. was. He uh, and working in the military, as a um, you know, uh, analyzing stuff for the military. Um, he was, of course, like mind blown when he saw this behavior because he just projected like the idea of a possible world where well, male intimacy could be different, yeah. you know. And uh, in Vietnam, when he saw this, he, uh, you know, we saw sometimes men still holding hand, and he was like young, you know, like in. 62, I, when I saw it for the first time, I couldn't help photographing it. And I was like, Joe, what do I'm talking about? Did you take like all these paparazzi photos when you were in Vietnam at the time? He was like, yeah. And I was like, do you still have them? And he was like, yeah, in his garage. He was later like, uh, uh, you know, like accused for being gay and had, l ha had and having relationship with uh, men, to, you know, and that would at the time cost you the security mm -hmm. clearance. And he negotiated with them, so he actually, um, uh, he was, you know, he couldn't work there anymore, but he got money to start something else. But, of but to be fired at the time, accused to be gay publicly, was of course a big shame, so he hadn't seen these photos since then. And mm -hmm. after the Vietnam tour trip, I would, fly back to LA and I cleaned up his garage and there was these I mean not like it was not only photos that was documenting something it was photos like this you know and yeah. um, and he yeah he 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 gave them to me yeah how did you decide to install them like I've installed them in very different variation. As you can see here, there was like uh, that was the first time I did it, where I introduced like all this idea of how Orientalism has existed, like Damascus um, patterns and even with the invitation cards, like this idea of uh, different Asian stuff. And, but then when you look at the picture, I always love the picture because it doesn't describe the subject. It describes uh, possibilities, you know? It's like, it, um, it, uh, it, it's images that describe a fantasy rather than what you see. Was it, I mean, through that trip that you took with uh, Joseph and, and through the pictures, was it also like living vicariously a little bit of like revisiting parts of your own like family history through these pictures? Or how was that relationship? It was it was strange. It was oh. uh, it was uh, yeah because I was negotiating between the subject and and at the same time I had to have the eyes of Joe. Like to, I yeah. think there was even like a logistic thing that I had to look into all these old. Uh, slides, you know, and find out what did he look at. Uh, fortunately, many times when when there was uh, guys holding hands, he would take several, so I would have an indication that something ha was happening here. No. I should not be the only one asking uh, questions here, and I do want to um, open it up to the floor. So maybe we could have some light in the room as well. That would be great, so I, we can see you. Um, as Andrea already said at the beginning, there are some microphones um, spread across the room, so just raise your hand, I'll do my best to see them. One of the people can give a shout, I have a question here in the front. Elizabeth will come your way presently. Yes, someone is running towards you. Yeah, over there. Thank you so much. So um, 
a lot of your work is, is clearly has, is imbued with such personal meaning for you, but you mentioned how it seems like you've come to, um, you're at peace with the fact that the viewer has their own meaning when they view this work to you that's very personal. So my question for you is, you've, you've been an artist for quite some time now, has that evolved at all over time, or was it at first uncomfortable for people you didn't know to create their own meaning from such personal work, or have you always kind of been at peace with that dynamic? Thank no, you. Um, uh, thanks for the question, because it, it uh, you know, like, when I started to exhibit from my first exhibitions, it's of course very different from today, where there's a lot of written information about the work. I think when I started, I was much more interested in, in films and how films could create narratives uh, or, or between, the, between the clips that you could, in between the gaps of um, filmmaking could make, could, it could create spaces for people to exist or to look into. And I just knew very early on that I couldn't do films, you know, it create, you know, like it, it was, I didn't, wouldn't know how to do that. But as a practicality, I, I, I was thinking, if I'm gonna be an artist that deals with the white cube, what is the, what is the quality of such a space? Mm -hmm. And my conclusion was that the, what the white cube was designed for was of course to amputate any kind of information uh, outside of the white cube. So it, it, it's a machine to amputate information. And what I thought when I started to do these projects was that we have to amplify the functionality of it. And what I was interested in is, was not like the idea of creating bridges, but to, to, to emphasize on the difference between me and you, you know, and how we negotiate that uh, that gap. And in so many ways, already at that time, I really never believed that an artist's role was to make bridges. I think through all the atrocities that is created in our world, I don't think the artist should be the one that creates bridges. I think for me, what the role I could participate in is to emphasize on the problems that we have in our society. How is it that we in a city like Chicago or any other cities coexist without really having relationship to, you know, depending on your gender, social classes, political ideas, but somehow it does, you know, so far at least. And how do we, um, I mean, I think these problems are questions that I wanted to emphasize on more than resolve at least. So going back to the first exhibitions, I thought that was an interesting room to create. Like I, I wanted really to have the viewer to, in one hand, to stand in front of Uma Totem, not knowing any information, recognize all these objects, but there was just something weird about it, you know? And that was enough for me. And at that time, I really, you know, like still today, I, I feel so privileged that for certain people, that is strangeness becomes something um, um, attractive to them, you know. And I think that's the first step you can do in any, in, you know, communication. And that was really uh, the beauty of it. I thought. Today is, of course, totally different. So I have like to change, change some strategies. Thank you for your question. Yes. Oh, in the back there. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Oh, wow. Uh, hi, Dan. Hi, Hendrix. I hope that I'm not butchering any of your names up. Um, thank you for being here. Um, Dan, some of the words in which you have used to address history has been reshuffling and compressing. Um, to me, this suggests that you are thinking about history in a material way. Um, I think about history um, like a shaken up solution in which narratives like particles sediment over time, solidifying history. If so, um, if history had a material quality, what would it be like to you? How would it behave? 
and what would it ask from you? Thank you. Material quality of history. I mean, mm -hmm. it is an important question um, in, in your practice, I think, in sort of um, that there are so many like materialities that you borrow and sort of appropriate that might be sort of imbued with meaning in their very sort of material. Yeah. Um, um. You, I, I, I really consider like uh, my um, these last fifteen years of work. It's it's a it's a quest for understanding it better. And you know, sometimes I think, why should we have these objects to store and to take up space? Um, so I I'm not I'm probably the wrong person to ask. But uh, recently uh, uh, there was. Uh, um, uh, I met a person that uh, that did a paper on my work, and he somehow hijacked that idea. And I I want to support that. He he says that he, his thinking is that these objects should uh, should give life to the ones that's dead, and um, remind us of of uh, people we care about and um, and uh, I I'm a, you know like I I uh, I was kind of impressed by his paper <laughs> yeah um, uh, Joshua you mean Almost yeah Joshua yeah, yeah. Joshua Ch Chambers Letson um, I think he's actually doing a book presentation t today now so. Uh, Joshua teaches at Northwestern in the Performance Studies uh, Department. He is uh, the um, chair of the graduate program, so you can find him now online. And uh, a presentation was at the Guggenheim, if I'm not mistaken, or was it somewhere else? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Um, I had a question here in the middle, maybe that hand. Yes, miss, please. Wait for the microphone, please. It's right here in the middle, the lady with the... The blue blouse. All right, quick question. When you're assembling statues that are a conglomeration of two different eras, how do you pick some of the historic pieces that you buy in auction or acquire? How, what attracts you to those? Um, for sure, the beauty of it, but also the um, you know, I have like a certain idea of how these things should uh, be put together, and uh, and um, yeah, it's it's a certain attraction for sure, and and if I can afford it or not. <laughs> Important. I'm also looking up. We haven't heard so much from the f up, but maybe that's okay. I'm focusing here again. We have room for one more question, um, sir. Here in the front, please go ahead. Um, thank you for the uh, entire talk. Um, I guess my question is going to be a bit like irrelevant a bit, but um, I was curious about how, like, when you lived in Copenhagen, um, what sort of differences that you had when living there, um, like, as your family is like Vietnamese, and how that has like sort of the sort of changes that or sort of differences that you had in your household versus other people living in Copenhagen. Yeah, I, um, you know, like as a child, you know, if I wasn't gay or grew up with Vietnamese parents, I would be a kind of macho, like terrible person. <laughs> I, I, I was so afraid as a child to be different, you know, like my par my mother would grow like weird herbs in the back garden instead of like roses or whatever. Yeah. And the idea of uh, of being different, I hated that, and uh, I I was even I was ashamed of my background in that sense. But I think I was forced out. Uh, you know, I was forced out. I had to accept that I'm not going to live like a normal life. I'm not going to be like everybody else. I have like to redefine what uh, what that would be. You know, and uh, and I think that has been a very big factor for defining who I am today and 
and learning that you know whatever tool you have like if it's a disqualification or not you if you hold it the right way it can you can hold you it can be a, become a weapon uh, i also have another question if that's okay i think we're going to take one question a person if that's okay because there are many people with questions uh this is the last one sorry i'm going to make a brutal decision um lady in the middle over there I really enjoyed your uh, installation piece with the bones hanging from the ceiling, and I was wondering if you could talk about that piece more in detail, like the concept or yeah, the message it's, you're um, trying to send. Yeah, it's uh, you know like I when I when I I try to expand in order to um, I expand like in in terms of material of uh, of history in order to understand it better, and I. I it was like this idea of think, thinking to use like mammoth bone with ivory and uh, and what that means you know and research you know like it it was weird because it came from the research of um, uh, of the landscape of europe and and uh, you know it's it's really thinking geological and i was doing like a lot of research about the landscaping you know like a lot of the seas around Denmark, but also the English Channel. It was all like land before the last uh, ice time, and uh, and I stumbled into this uh, beautiful, interesting place at least, where where the fishers have when they throw like fish in the English Channel, they find like all these mammoth bones because it was the old delta where a lot of animals would live before the last ice time, like 10, 10 12,000 years ago. And how the, the Catholic Church for years have had to hit that. It's actually in, in, in Dutchland, no? uh, in uh, Holland. Um, and, and that came, you know, that, that dragged me into this material and, and uh, created this installation. Maybe one question to end with, um, because at the beginning, at the very beginning, you said, you know, a lot of these exhibitions have also been using the museum as a kind of studio, as a kind of experimental ground in which to think about the relationship between uh, objects and creating this sort of uh, assemblages, if you will. Now that you have a studio, how, how has the thinking shifted in that respect? Is, is, an, ex is an exhibition sort of more like a step two or f more of intent in that mm. respect or I'm just very curious. Yeah, for sure. You know, like what I enjoy a lot, this is the first year I've tried it, is like I can, I think when I was younger, I, I think naive, to be naive have a certain quality, you know, I was, I could jump into whatever, I didn't have any fear, you know. Today I don't think I have that courage anymore. I mean, not to that degree at least, but also the desire to look at something and to turn, you know, that was what I did with all the exhibition. I had works coming back and I could look at it again. But it's a privilege today to have a studio where you can sit with the work and you can think about it, you can look again at it. And, uh, and that has been fantastic. But you know, it's in the countryside, so actually I do mostly gardening. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jan, so much. Please give him a warm applause. <laughs>